Welcome back from your break. And if you're joining us online, please open in your Bibles. I'm going to call an audible uh, Jim to start things. The second Samuel. We'll come back to Exodus in a moment. To second Samuel chapter 12, which is a few more books into your Old Testament. So after you get past the first five books of the Old Testament, the books of Moses, you'll get into the histories of the Israelites. Second Samuel chapter 12. I didn't tell Jim I was doing this, so you can either look it up in your scripture, open up your smartphone, or just listen as I tell you a familiar story about the very famous king. And then I want to illustrate a modern analogy using two children, because the children are here with us, who have new transformer toys. Let's read Second Samuel chapter 12, beginning in verse 1. I'm just going to read the first few verses of that familiar story, true story, uh, the first six verses, pray and then make my analogy so the kids can participate meaningfully with their parents today. This is God's word. And the Lord sent Nathan to David. Nathan is a prophet. David is the king. Nathan came to David and said to him, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up, and it grew up with him and with his children. It used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms, and it was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was unwilling to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man, for the traveler who had come to him. Then King David's anger was greatly kindled against the man and said to the prophet Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Let me pray. Lord, thank you as we consider your laws for community today from your precious word. And I pray you would take what can seem to be very old and ancient, at times irrelevant, hard to understand, and even boring in their application. Laws, make them relevant in Christ and point us to not only Jesus' authority, but the life he gives to any and us when we repent and believe and live through him. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. David was told a story by the prophet Nathan to show him his complicity in something he had done that was very bad to which he was not willing to admit. Imagine, and I'm just imagining this, two brothers Two brothers that are living at home, and one brother has all of the Transformers, and the other brother has one. But the one that he has is shiny new. And a friend comes over to see the one brother who has all of the Transformer dolls. Do you know what I'm saying when we say Transformers? Is that too old? Okay, someone's acknowledging. You're, and we're with you. A friend comes over to play with the one brother who has all the Transformer dolls. And the brother says, you know what? I don't want you to play with my Transformer dolls. But my brother has a brand new shiny one in his room. Let's go and play with that one. And they do. And while they're playing with the one shiny brand new Transformer dolls and not with all the other shiny Transformer dolls that the older brother has, something terrible happens. 
the transformer doll that's made by Hasbro is broken. They break his little arm off and they hide the broken transformer doll so the younger brother, when he comes back to his room, will not discover it. What should they do? Well, welcome to the pages of Exodus. Because in the passage we're about to read from Exodus chapter 21, God gives good laws because he's a gracious God to his people when someone breaks your toys or burns your field or breaks into your home. And the principles we read here not only reveal that God is just and God is compassionate, but they find their way into the New Testament and are to characterize the people of God when Jesus changes our hearts and we submit to Jesus' authority and as we often say, love our neighbor, whether they be a Christian neighbor or not. For his glory. Exodus chapter 20. Kids, there's not a single mention of the Transformers in what we're about to read, but I'm coming back to that story. So hang on. Exodus chapter, excuse me, 21, beginning in verse 33. And we'll read through the first 14 verses of Exodus 22. This is God's word. When a man opens a pit, or when a man digs a pit and does not cover it, and an ox or a donkey falls into it, the owner of the pit shall make restoration. He shall give money to its owner, and the dead beast shall be his. When one man's ox butts another so that it dies, then they shall sell the live ox and share its price, and the dead beast also they shall share. Or if it is known that the ox has been accustomed to gore in the past, its owner has not kept it in. He shall repay ox for ox, and the dead beast shall be his. If a man steals an ox or a sheep and kills it or sells it, he shall repay five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. If a thief is found breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there shall be no blood guilt for him, but if the sun has risen on him, there shall be blood guilt for him. He shall surely pay. If he has nothing, then he shall be sold for his theft. If the stolen beast is found alive in his possession, whether it is an ox or a donkey or a sheep, he shall pay double. Verse 5. If a man causes a field or vineyard to be grazed over or lets his beast loose and it feeds in another man's field, he shall make restitution from the best in his own field and in his own vineyard. If a fire breaks out and catches in thorns so that the stacked grain or the standing grain or the field is consumed, he who started the fire shall make full restitution. If a man gives to his neighbor money or goods to keep safe and it is stolen from the man's house, then if the thief is found, he shall pay double. If the thief is not found, the owner of the house shall come near to God to show whether or not he has put his hand to his neighbor's property. For every breach of trust, whether it is for an ox, for a donkey, for a sheep, for a cloak, or any kind of lost thing of which one says, this is it, the case of both parties shall come before God. The one whom God condemns shall pay double to his neighbor. If a man gives to his neighbor a donkey or an ox or a sheep or any beast to keep safe and it dies or is injured or is driven away without anyone seeing it, an oath by the Lord shall be between them both to see whether or not he has put his hand to his neighbor's property. The owner shall accept the oath. He shall not make restitution. But if it is stolen from him, he shall make restitution to its owner. If it is torn by beasts, let him bring it as evidence. He shall not make restitution for what has been torn. If a man borrows anything of his neighbor and it is injured or dies, the owner not being with it, he shall make full restitution. 
If the owner was with it, he shall not make restitution. If it was hired, it came for its hiring fee. Thanks be to God for his word to us. We are in a portion of the book of Exodus that has been unfolding as God himself, Yahweh, enters into a covenant, a binding commitment and loving, holy relationship with the Israelites, having borne them on eagles' wings from Egypt and brought them to himself through the wilderness to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. They are to have a distinct identity as a people, and their lifestyle is to reflect God's just and compassionate laws. We're in that part of Exodus, which has been called the Book of the Covenant. It began with the Ten Commandments back in Exodus 20, and now continues in what many have likened to be case laws, examples of how the Ten Commandments could and should be applied in the everyday life of the Israelites who lived in an agricultural society, very much unlike our own. And we note that even in reading the text that we did because we see the repetition of the word, and these are God's words, so they're important, in verse 33, when a man. Verse 35, when a man. Verse 1 of 22, chapter, if a man steals an ox. Verse 5, if a man. Verse 6, if fire. These are case laws. In other words, if the Ten Commandments is the Constitution, although this is God's word, it's inspired, then these are the judgments that are handed down by the judges and elders of God's people as they seek to build a society and form a nation that is both just and compassionate in their relationships with one another. And in doing so, they're taking the commandments found in the Ten Commandments and applying them to these particular situations. So last week, we looked at how would Israelites apply the commandments that prohibit murder, which is a capital offense, the taking of an innocent life, in their everyday life, and how their treatment of slaves, household slaves, different from the American experience of slavery, which we elaborated, and I hope you'll take time to listen to that because it's crucial to distinguish the two. They are clearly not equivalents. How Israelites are to live with indentured servants justly. And now we come to a portion of the law where it seems that another commandment, commandments that deal with property, the eighth commandment, thou shall not steal, would be justly and compassionately applied. And so I want to make three comments to introduce this. And then look at two sections. We can't go through it all, although we, if you want to stay after, we can certainly go through it all, and I, it'd be a very profitable exercise that help us make application and see what the New Testament does with these three first underlying principles that help us understand these laws first. Did you notice it was God's idea that private property is a good idea? Did you notice that? Although the words private property are never used it, the Israelites' private property is protected because it's good. And therefore, laws that he gives which protect it are considered just and compassionate. How else do we understand laws about an open pit and an ox falling in and the principle of restitution, or more importantly, of someone breaking in in chapter 22 into your, albeit, mud, clay, built house or tent, not your house with security alarms and local police you can call with a simple push of the button. How else do we understand these laws unless private property is only a gift from the Lord, it is protected by his law. Thus, in American jurisprudence, 
where we see private property being protected and affirmed, that's a legacy of the Bible, not the genius of our founders or even Adam Smith. And history students, you can quote me on that. Thank God our founders were shaped by that Bible. Secondly, when your or my property is damaged or stolen, there is the need for restitution. That's the second principle we read about. Meaning, and I don't know, I don't use that word every day. I've never said to Linda and recently on a date night or otherwise, I demand restitution. But restitution simply means when you take something that is mine or you damage something, accidentally or not, you have to pay it back plus some. Simple. Pay it back plus some. You kill my ox, you restore my ox, plus some. It's called restitution, and it's repeated throughout this principle. And it is a principle that Jesus brings into the gospel story. So clearly, it's a part of God's law that when written on our hearts, we can give expression to as evidence of our repentance and faith. We'll look at that later. Third, we not only see private property is good, it's God's idea, and there's the principle of restitution. But we see that the Bible doesn't measure crimes and personal injury based on your social status. In other words, we are all treated equally in God's eyes under the law. There was an ancient code during that time that Israelites may have been familiar of, and it clearly makes some influence here. You've heard it before. We read it in Exodus 21, verse 23, the phrase, an eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth, a wound for a wound, a burn for a burn. That actually has also ancient origins in something called the Code of Hammurabi. I'm not going to lose you with a long history lesson, but that's an ancient, ancient law code that my dad had to study when he went to law school. I've got his law books on my shelf. But the difference was for the Babylonian Code of Hammurabi, if you were rich and I was poor and I stole from you, I would die. But if I was rich and Dan was poor and I stole from him, I'd pay a fine. That's how they did it. I believe you call that partiality. But in Israel, there was to be no partiality. Thus, when King David says, that man shall pay fourfold for taking that you, not realizing you're the man, you didn't take a lamb, you took Bathsheba, he was inspired as he is a type of Christ, by the Spirit of God in that moment, applying the principle of restitution to his own soul. And he knew, I need a Savior. See, before the law, whether you're a king or a pauper, you stand before a holy, just, and compassionate God who treats you the same, whether you've got six figures in your bank account or six cents, because his law is just. And there's some other applications here too. As we look carefully then at the law, I want to make this big point, and then we'll apply it to two sections and make a gospel application. God calls us as Christians, God calls us as followers of Jesus, God calls us to protect our neighbor's welfare and make things right when their well-being is violated. God calls us to protect our neighbor's welfare and make things right when their well-being is violated. And I want to show you that main point by looking at both the principle of private property and the principle of restitution in the laws about theft that we looked at at the beginning of chapter 22. So let's look again at the beginning of chapter 22. The first four verses, I won't belabor this. The eighth commandment's clearly being applied for these elders and judges that will, that will govern Israel in future scenarios when they are in the promised land or even before that, but for their life together in the promised land, let's, let's I suppose that, where there has been basic theft. If a man steals 
your ox or sheep and kills it or sells it, he shall repay five oxen for an ox and four sheep for a sheep. So children, if you would never do this, but if your older brother and his friend steal your new transformer doll and break it and hide it so that they won't be responsible, well, we find ourselves in Exodus 22, verse 1. He shall repay for the ox. Do you see that? Five oxen. I don't, I don't even know what an ox is, but that's a lot of oxen. That's got to be really expensive. Or four sheep for a sheep. If you are found guilty of stealing. In other words, right there at the jump. If you're caught and you've broken the eighth commandment, you will not be executed, but you will pay back plus some. And that plus some is hefty. Five oxen for one stolen. Oxen were valuable and expensive. Sheep were less valuable, but nonetheless important to a farmer. Four sheep for one stolen. Hmm. Laws concerning basic theft allowed not only restoration of property, but notice this, the elimination of any harm done to the harmony of the community through restitution and therefore no grudges for the thief for stealing your oxen once he makes restitution, once she pays full sheep and full. What about if they break into my home? I mean, that would, I've never had someone break into my home. I have had our neighborhood cat try to get into our home, but that's another story. I, but here, it's not a home like your home or mine. There's no driveway. There's no alarm system. There's no gate at the beginning. These are mud clay dwellings or tents if they're in the wilderness. And you can, you can dig your way through them if you have long fingernails or dig your way under them pretty easily. There's no police to call. There's no 911 in that moment. But it says in verse 3, if a thief is found breaking in and is struck so that he dies, there shall be no blood guilt for the owner. But if the sun has risen, meaning the thief broke in during the daytime, and you kill him, brace yourself, the owner is guilty. He shall surely pay. How can that be? Well, the thought here in God's community is, yes, the thief that comes in at night, you don't know that he is a thief or she is a thief. And so you may feel that they're there to harm you physically, and so you're defending yourself. But if you can see, I'm making this up. Dan, you can yell at me afterwards. If Dan is breaking into my house because he hears I have a lot of transformer dolls and I see him and I take out my golf club and I beat him so that he's dead and I can see him, I have broken God's law as it applied to the Israelites. It's there in verse 2. It was easy to break into those homes. Sun up or sun down. But the law distinguished between night and day because unlike the ancient pagan nations that always executed the thief, in God's world and community, the thief must pay restitution. But it was not a capital offense if he was caught. What about when there's carelessness? Boy, this certainly applies to me. What about if I let... My cattle graze, verse 5 and 6, over on your field because boundary lines in the promised land wouldn't be clear always. Maybe there were some ancient stones, but it's not like today where we have fences. Or what about if my cows or my oxen or my sheep grazed on your vineyard? What would I do in verse 5 and 6? If my beasts are loose and feeds on your fields, I must pay back plus some. I must make restitution. Do you see that in verse 6? 
if fire breaks out and catches in thorns so that the stacked grain or the standing grain on the field, why would a fire break out on my field? Well, in ancient practices of farming, you probably remember this from ancient history, the chaff and the, 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 the crops that were, were still there lying on the field that were not harvested, farmers would often burn the field to clear out the refuse. So if I start a friendly burn to burn my field and it gets away from me and it burns my neighbor's field, then he is due restitution. You start to get the feeling that if you're going to be a part of God's kingdom and part of his community, that you have to take responsibility for your neighbor's welfare when it comes to their personal property. And his law, which is both just and compassionate, requires that not only there be restitution, but there be no grudges against the person who was careless so that harmony and unity can be restored. What about if I lend you verse 7 through 15, because I'm going away on a trip. If I lend you money or some goods to keep safe, or if I give you my donkey, verse 10, or ox or sheep to keep safe while I'm away, and while you're t- taking care of it, the beast is stolen, verse 7, from me. Or the beast or whatever I've left in your possession dies or is injured, verse 10, or driven away without anyone seeing it. The third and final category when it comes to these laws and rules and case laws has to do with borrowing and safekeeping. So imagine I left, I'm the older brother in my earlier industry, my, my set of transformers with Jackie, and I go away for a few weeks to see my grandparents, and I come back, and I'm so looking forward to playing with my set of transformers. And I get home, and she says, I'm so sorry, but they're missing. I say, they're what? They're missing. Well, in that moment, I might be tempted to think you've stolen them. But if it's determined that you haven't stolen them because no thief can be found, and it wasn't injured or consumed by a wild beast or however you apply that to the transformer. We go before the elders, we take an oath before the Lord, and we basically swear on our conscience, and we say, as God is my witness, I did not steal your transformers. I don't know where they are, but we commit this to the Lord and entrust you, Lord, who see all things, to bring justice, but also show compassion to the innocent and make restitution. Wow. It's more than that that it's not less than that. It's a community that is submitted to God's law first and the authority of God's king as they go about being a holy nation. When stuff happens with our stuff and we need and demand justice. The oath I'm speaking of is seen there in verse 11. And the passage ends with these verses. Verse 14, if a man borrows anything of his neighbor and it is injured or dies, the owner not being with it, he shall make, there it is, full restitution. If the owner was with it, he shall not make restitution. If it was hired, it came for his hiring. So we learn here that the principle of private property and the practice of restitution really brings to the forefront for Israel, my final point as I conclude, the priority of neighborly love. That God's people under God's king, following God's rules and laws, demonstrate the priority of neighborly love. And we learn from God's law that his character not only is just, but compassionate. So for the guilty, 
rather than being killed, perhaps as they would be in another society, they can, when caught, make restitution, pay back plus some, and be restored to the community. Amen? Come on. Amen? And for the one sinned against who has restitution paid to them, he or she is not allowed to carry grudges, but must, when restitution is made, receive back the brother or sister because they are part of God's community. Amen? Amen. So that brings us to, of course, Zacchaeus. Just days away from the cross, Jesus is. He's on his way to Jerusalem. And the most hated man in town in Luke 17 Little, wee, little, wee, little, wee, little Zacchaeus is climbing up the sycamore tree. Linda recently pointed out a sycamore tree on the way to the Lowe's and Plainville. If that's what he climbed, he was like in the bleacher seats of Gillette Stadium. That thing was huge. But I digress. He climbs up the tree because he wants to see Jesus who's coming to down. And what does Jesus say to him? He says, Zacchaeus, say it with me. Come down from that tree because I want to sup with you this evening. The people are aghast. Zacchaeus is a thief. He's been ripping off God's people as a Jewish employee of the Roman Empire, taking not just what their taxes required, but aggrandizing himself by taking a multiple, making himself personally rich at the expense of his neighbors. They hated him. And it says in Luke 17, if I have the citation right, that that evening, that evening, something remarkable happened to Zacchaeus, the sheep rustler, the tax thief, the, the, whatever those words are when you rip off your neighbors through taxes and steal from them, the jerk. Am I allowed to say that? Salvation came to his house. How would Jesus know that? Certainly we know because we have Exodus 21. It says he paid fourfold what he had taken from his Jewish neighbors, which would be a lot because he had received Christ and he had repented of his sins in receiving Christ. And now he was free under the authority of the Messiah to not only receive him and repent of his greed, but live freely by keeping the requirements of the law and restoring to his community what he had taken. What's the gospel application, I think? Well, I think for Christians, first and foremost, we must acknowledge that Jesus who lived the perfect life, obeying all the laws and commandments as our representative, as our substitute. He not only never stole anything from anyone, but when he died, he died as a thief, taking upon himself the sins of thieves, and in so doing, receiving the just penalty for all of our sins, so that in being raised again, having died in our place, having atoned the wrath of God for that breaking of the Eighth Commandments, thieves like me and perhaps you could be forgiven, amen, by repenting and receiving him and living under the authority of King Jesus and his finished work on the cross. So the laws of restitution point God's people to the perfect Son of God. But when Jesus comes to our lives, he calls us to repent. He calls us to repent and receive him through believing in him, but also by submitting to his authority, repent and receive him, and therefore begin to live as free Christians submitted to the law that is now written on our hearts, which we talked about last week. And so Zacchaeus, through a change of his heart, keeps the law of restitution as evidence of his repentance, and the whole community could see it. Here's where I'm going with this. Repentance unto life 
when we come to Christ and following our conversion as we walk with Christ, repentance unto life is always a process. But it evidences itself, yes, in our actions and the fruit we bear towards others. Towards others. I know a man. I know a man who lied to his employer. He lied to his employer when his employer said to him, we've got a big event. I'll say his name is Bauer. And we need you to stay till 7 o'clock. And Bauer, who had worked very hard that day, and had a young family with four young children that were waiting for daddy to come home, he left at 5 o'clock because he was tired of working, even though he had worked since 7 that morning. And the next day, his employer said to him, Bauer, did you leave early? The event didn't end until 7. Where were you? Well, I went home. I had to take care of my family. I had been there since 7. But you told me you'd be there till 7. So others had to be asked, and they cleaned up, and that's fine. If you had come to me and told me, Linda's at home, God bless her, four young children, they're all screaming at this point, where's daddy? I would have released you, but you gave me your word. You said you'd be there. This was a Christian man. You didn't follow through. And I ask him, I am so sorry. You are right. I didn't lie this time. I was convicted. How can I make that up to you? He said, just come and ask me next time. I said, no, I won't learn my lesson. That's too easy. This is what I'll do. I left two hours early. For the next two weeks, I will stay two hours late. Not because I'm guilty, but because I want to show by my actions I learned my lesson. And when you give someone your word, Christian or not, you do it. You do it. And you don't say, oh, forget about it. Jesus is my savior. That's how you take care of your neighbor. That's how you show, albeit imperfectly, and you probably have better examples. How do we evidence this reality when God calls us to protect our neighbor's welfare and make things right when their well-being is violated by something we've done or not done? How do we take responsibility for our actions, pay back plus some when our actions, either due to carelessness or more, in my case, more high-handed, impact theirs and honors God and restores harmony as we love our God commands. Having said that, my employer, if he changed his opinion of me and held a grudge against me, because he was Christian, and said, because you left early, I now have you as Bauer who always leaves early and can't be relied upon even though he makes Christian. Well, he's sinning too, because he's not allowed to keep a grudge anymore. I've been restored. I'm part of God's people, not just forgiven, but I've made restitution. Wow. Wow. God's laws are so much better. Jesus' kingdom is so much more freeing because it's his authority, not ours. And when we do what he calls us to do, it's not only countercultural. Ah, oh, we live. We live through the freedom of loving God and loving neighbors by making things right when their well-being has been harmed. Let's pray. Lord, these windows into your wisdom as we look at your holy, just, and compassionate law, oh, they challenge us, Lord. If, like me, we're tempted to relegate these codes to the the bins of history and not see how some of these principles, Lord, not only have shaped our culture today, Lord, but Lord, they, through Christ, they, they call us, they call us, Lord, to, to be distinct in our neighborly relations and in our one another's for the glory of our lover. Lord, there are probably few churches, there may be some, but few churches that have spent any time in the book of the covenant. That doesn't make us special or unique or certainly holier, but Lord, your word is true. 
and it goes with us. And so help us as we go into our week to be more like Jesus in protecting our neighbor's welfare, making things right when their well-being is harmed in some way, and Lord, doing it all out of the grace and mercy we've received through having the Spirit who indwells us and writing the law upon our heart. Call us to live out of our identity before others. We are Christ's redeemed people. We live for His glory. And when my oxen graze on your field and do damage, I am called for Christ's sake to make it right. Oh, Lord, be glorified through your law and more importantly through Christ who dwells in our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name and everyone said, amen. Let's stand.